Let's Talk Money. Hello and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk Money. I'm your host, Surabhi Upadhyay. Questions when it comes to mutual funds. When to buy a fund? When to exit out of a fund? Should I buy a fund because it's uh, dealing with a sector that's doing really well in the market right now? Should I buy a fund because my friend has an investment and feels it has great potential? Should I exit now because the fund is simply not performing? These are some of the most basic issues and questions that we investors face all the time with respect to our mutual fund portfolios. But is there a bias, an investing or a behavioral bias coming in our mind which is preventing us from really optimizing our portfolio returns? This is the million or maybe the billion dollar question. And to help me answer this today, I have with me Kostav Belapurkar, who's director of fund research at Morningstar. Kostav, thank you so much for joining in. Welcome to Let's Talk Money. Thank you so much, Sarabhi, for having me on the show. Super excited to be here. Absolutely. And welcome back to the studios <laughs> because, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Kostav is coming back, I think, first uh, COVID, post-COVID appearance That's right, in person. Yeah. It's almost like a debut <laughs> of sorts. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And you picked a really, really, should I say easy subject to talk about? Uh, easy? <laughs> the, the most difficult yeah, one. I was absolutely. being sarcastic. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it's... You know, it sounds easy at the surface. Yeah. You know, oh, it sounds intuitive. Yeah. But actually, like it's you said, you know, but. behavioral biases, <laughs> yeah. we're all susceptible to them, right? So, yeah. uh, be it the most proficient portfolio manager, mm -hmm. investment advisors, investors, yeah. all of them are susceptible to behavioral biases. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's start from the very beginning, right? And uh, the golden rule in the market, which all wise men will tell us, buy when the market is falling and sell when the market is going to an all-time high. It's just easier said than done, isn't it? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I mean, we, we have all these rules in our mind, but when things are either super exuberant mm -hmm. or they're falling, you know, we tend to ex act exactly in the opposite manner in which we're supposed to act. Mm. I think somewhere maybe investors are getting a little, you know, more mature as we yeah. go along, but I think there's a, still a fair bit of journey to cover. Yeah. You know, there are newer and newer investors coming on, mm. and slowly we'll, we'll kind of, you know, bridge that, what we call the behavioral gap. Absolutely, uh, you know, absolutely. No, you, you're right, and I take mm -hmm. that point because I think after COVID, if there's one thing that investors are showcasing in their behavior is mm -hmm. that one thing's become clear. When the market is showing a major dip, you have to deploy money. And we're seeing that, right? Yeah. Retail investors have been uh, really drivers of this big three-year run, bull run mm -hmm. that we've had after COVID. But the question is, when it comes to individual funds, at an aggregate level, yes, I need to buy equity when the market's mm -hmm. falling. But when it comes to individual funds, that's when that decision-making gets really, really complex. Yes. So let's start by understanding this behavioral, you know, investor return gap study that you folks did at Morningstar. What was it all about? Yeah, sure. So a very interesting study, and we've been doing this globally for many, many years. And, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of years ago, we thought, you know, India's ripe for doing this study and essentially what it looks to do. You know, we're obviously a significantly growing market in terms of assets and, you know, newer and newer investors are coming in. What the study looks to do is that, you know, if you looked at the published returns of a strategy, mm. and, you know, you can do it across asset classes, and we ran that for the entire set of, you know, be it equity, fixed income, commodity funds, allocation funds, the whole mm -hmm. suite of funds, mm -hmm. right? There's a published return. I mean, if I, you know, pick up a fact sheet, I would see that here's your one-year, three-year, five-year return for sure. the fund, right? Sure. That is the published return. If I invested on day one, right? Mm -hmm. Let's assume that a fund returned 15% uh, over the last five years. Had I invested five years ago, Mm -hmm. and stayed invested for that entire period, mm -hmm. only then would I as an investor have made that entire 15% return, sure. which is a pretty amazing return yeah. to have. Right? Yeah. But the challenge is investors come in and out of the fund at different points of time. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, uh, you know, like we spoke about behavioral biases. The moment you see that a particular fund is doing exceedingly well, now that's already passed, right? Yeah. Investors rush That's into when that they'll fund. rush in and, you know, want to deploy the money. Yeah. Absolutely. So what we calculate is essentially what is the average return earned by every single rupee invested in that fund. Okay. Right? So, I mean, let's just take an example that you had a, say, three years ago, mm -hmm. there was a fund that was, you know, very simple uh, illustration. It was a 1,000 crore fund. Okay. And today it's a 10,000 crore fund. Right? Okay. In three years, it's grown 10x. Right? Okay. Maybe in the year one, there was only 1,000 crores and maybe... You know, the, the return, let's just assume, was 30%, right? Okay. Year two, and this is a very simplistic example, mm -hmm. but I'll drive home the point, right? It became 20% in year two. Okay. It's kind of been tapering off. Mm -hmm. And year three, mm -hmm. it's 10%. Positive, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of been falling down. Right? Okay. Now, you had 1,000 crores in year one. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, looking at some of that return, another 500 crores of new investor money yeah. came in. 
now sitting at the end of year two because you are a 30 and 20 you know so really when are you time. assuming this 500 crores came in looking at the first year return let's just assume for some say sake that it came in through average over the period over of the that first, first year of that fund right? yeah. okay. okay but a very small amount came in right okay but a bulk of the money mm. say came in between year two and year three mm. you know say about eight thousand seven thousand once people saw oh this fund is giving 30 percent i should get in absolutely so year two yeah. is when people started Correct. you know jumping Correct. on and, and now, when mm -hmm. we think about the return series, right? Mm. If you had stayed invested through the entire period, you made about, if my math is right, about 72% absolute return. Mm -hmm. If you came in at the start of the fund and stayed for the entire three yeah. years. But if you came in only after one year, I think that number would drop to about 32%, right? Oh. Because but you missed the first 30%. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But if you came in at the end of the second year, mm. you only made only 10%, right? Correct. And if a right. bulk of the money is actually coming during that period after mm. that 30 plus 20, you know, 30 into yeah. 20 is yeah. actually already yeah. been delivered, yeah. uh, the bulk of the investors have actually not made that 72%. They're probably mm -hmm. at 14, 15%. So that's the concept of investor return. So while the printed return for a fund may look great, yeah. if the assets have grown significantly, yeah. uh, the uh, you know the investor return is going to be uh, you know significantly low. You know that's a really interesting point. Actually, we're putting some graphics up on the screen which illustrate uh, some of the return, some of the uh, sort of takeaways from this particular study, where uh, in three years the fund return is 10.45 percent, whereas the investor return is just under nine percent in five year. In a five-year period, uh, the fund return is about 8.8% 8 .8 rounded off. Investor return is 7.5%. First of all, is this like diversified equity funds at an aggregate level? Uh, this is actually for the entire industry. Okay. So it would be equity funds, sectoral thematic funds, okay. uh, fixed income funds, commodity oh, okay. funds, and okay. allocation funds. Everything put together. But if you were to actually break it down, yeah. uh, when you think about uh, you know, what are, say, for instance, equity funds, mm -hmm. you would typically have higher gaps mm -hmm. because it's a more volatile mm -hmm. asset class. Mm -hmm. Even with an equity, mm -hmm. typically more narrower thematic funds mm -hmm. would actually have a much significantly higher gap as compared to say a flexi cap or a large cap. Got it, so got I think it. those are some of the observations that very clearly came out. Okay. Uh, because you know the, the, these kind of decisions are very fraught at timing risk, right? And mm. the greater the lumpiness of the return, mm. the greater the gap that can be what an average investor earned versus what the fund actually. Okay, so I think the numbers on the screen really tell us that not necessarily will you make enough return or enough money in a fund that otherwise uh, is showing excellent printed returns. So then how to solve for it? Simple question. <laughs> yeah. What so, do we do? Again, I think it's going back to basics, mm -hmm. right? The first thing is always think about, you know, I mean, the holy grail is, is asset allocation, right? Mm. I mean, thinking about your risk return objectives, time horizon, always asset allocate. Mm. Always kind of build that in that, you know, if markets are overheated or cheap, like mm. you alluded to, yeah. rebalance. Yeah. And have that, you know, automatically set in in terms of, you know, a rule-based or you have an advisor who helps you do that. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, there's no, I mean, you reduce the amount of human element to that decision making, right? Because okay. If you think I'm going to do it on the fly and that, okay, let me wait for the market to fall. Which uh, is what most people you know, think of which doing. Which most people think of doing. Right? Put those simple rules down okay. and try to stick to it as much as possible. It goes okay. a long way in building that discipline. Okay. I think the third very important, very useful tool that the industry has really you know, built very beautifully is uh, SIPs. Right? The systematic investment plan. Absolutely. It's that yeah. autopilot mode where you yeah. keep putting in the money. You're not doing that allocation. Timing of the yeah, market. Absolutely. And of which yeah. takes care yeah of a lot of those behavioral risks. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the fourth and the most important thing, typically most investors, when you think about building, say, an equity portfolio, largely would be best served by buying a diversified equity fund. Could be across you know, various market mm -hmm. cap buckets. Mm -hmm. Try to limit you know, very narrow sort of investment universe funds like thematics uh -huh. or sectoral, uh -huh. because those are susceptible to large timing risk. US right? technology fund or a, you know, or a NASDAQ fund absolutely. and all of that. Yeah, or an infrastructure fund. Or, or an infrastructure, know, the, or a PSU yeah, fund. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to tell you, that's the hard part because they look fabulous. They look hot, right? When Nvidia is surging 50% and then you are in a fund mm -hmm. which is tracking yeah. the US tech boom. Uh, so, you know, let's come down to that question now uh, on, on thematics and sectorals, and that's sort of a large part of uh, this conversation as well. Because the temptation is so significant, you know, to go for these funds, how should one approach them and, and what are the pitfalls? So I think the most important thing about, you know, sectoral funds, like I said, there are two ways of doing it, right? So one is, remember, when you're buying into a diversified equity fund to start with, the manager who's a professional money manager is also taking underweight or weight calls in a particular sector depending on their uh, you know sort of conviction levels sure, right sure. but they're doing it in a sort of gradual graded manner mm -hmm. it's not a binary decision yeah. right because if you're buying say a technology fund right today 
you're going all in, you know, I mean, imagine if that's your only fund in the portfolio, right? That's all oh. exposed to one sector. Now that's and super scary. high risk. Absolutely, yeah. right? But yeah. if you buy a diversified equity fund, mm. typically, you know, the manager will have guardrails saying that, okay, look, I'm going to maybe go overweight, underweight, three to five percent on a particular sector, right? Mm. So, I mean, th there are reasons why those guardrails are built mm -hmm. in that. So mm -hmm. no one goes gungo and over allocates to a particular mm -hmm. sector, right? Mm -hmm. So a diversified equity fund is actually a great way to even take exposure where a professional manager is taking those Let the professional do the straight. job. Yeah. Don't try and sort of go on funds. Uh, you know, um, uh, Kasab, I want to talk about the study that you folks did on <laughs> showing this whole entry-exit business, mm -hmm. how that becomes trickier for, uh, for sectoral and thematic funds, right? Because yeah. they're narrow, they can have a couple of months of fabulous performance and then a couple of, you know, months or years when they're complete duds. Is, yeah. Isn't that so? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, we, we speak about, you know, that sectors go through periods of outperformance and underperformance. I mean, mm -hmm. the winners and losers keep keep rotating, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I just think of a classic case was technology funds, real-life example. Mm -hmm. uh, Post-COVID, mm -hmm. right, you, have, you know, there was a significant run-up in, in tech the tech sector in the years of 2020, 2021. Yeah. Probably, you know, amongst the best performing sectors during yeah. that period of time, right? And what happened was mm -hmm. um, exactly, you know, kind of the illustration that I gave. Yeah. Right? You know what? Hang on. Let, let me pull that illustration up. We'll just put it up for our viewers as well. There's a heat map of sorts which helps us understand why it would be wrong to assume that a single sector can keep consistently outperforming in the market for long periods of time. So let me just quickly go back and talk about this uh, particular map that, that you were referring to. Uh, so this is what we've got. We've uh, basically looked at uh, data from 2019 onwards, this is pre-COVID, and we're talking about, let's say, the top five performing sectors in any given year. So how to read this? Very simple. We go back to 2019, consumer durables was the best performing sector that year. Was it the best performer in the subsequent year? The answer is no. Was it the top performer in 2021? The answer is no. In fact, this sector was constantly dipping in the subsequent years. Let me take one more example. Banking was uh, number two in 2019, but it's nowhere in the top five in 2020 or in 2021. It only comes back in 2022. So again, that's where entry and exit. I mean, do we know, do you and I know when to get in and when to get out? Let's take one more example. We all remember what happened to healthcare during COVID, the peak of the crisis. Pharma stocks were really going through the roof. Look at that, 60% return in 2020. But what happened after that? Healthcare is absolutely nowhere to be found in 21, 22. And it comes back in the top three in 2023. So I guess, uh, you know, the short point, Kossab, is that it's very difficult to predict whether some of these patterns and some of these moves, uh, whether they can last, right? Because now, now we're in a, in a space where capex and infrastructure is the big theme. So I guess it would be very natural for someone to believe that they should have a, an infra fund in their portfolio, right? Yeah. It's natural to believe. And, you know, honestly, they should have believed that maybe three years ago. Oh, okay. uh, You know, because, again, I mean, if you look at the chart right yeah. here, right? I yeah. mean, you see the cap goods has now probably been the best 40%, performing. 40%, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's always typically what happens. And, you know, the example that I was using, say, for, for instance, technology, uh, we saw this great run-up in, in IT, and you can see that on, on the chart, you know, amongst the top five sectors mm -hmm. in 2020, 2020, after healthcare, it's right. IT next, yeah. There was hardly any money lying in technology funds at the start of 2020. Even till the end of 2021, there was only some money building up. Probably mm. the slightly more nuanced investors came in. Mm -hmm. The bulk of the money came in 2022 after mm. the rally had already happened. Mm. Right? So when we ran the same study for, you know, I spoke about that there can be larger gaps of yeah. uh, sector funds. It was staggering, right? So technology over a three-year period, mm -hmm. and this is data as of June 2022, mm. uh, the CAGR for the funds was about 27%. Right. So the fund returns are 27% over three years. Yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous, right? Yeah, I, mean, I take would, it with both yeah, hands. 27% in three absolutely. years, right? <laughs> but the average rupee invested, the investor return, uh -huh. was 3.2%, right? Explain Ouch. that. How is that yeah. possible? Ouch. How, right? how so is the investor return just 3%? Because, uh -huh. you know, the same example that I used, right? Yeah. There was about, you know, assume that there was a very small amount of AUM in tech funds mm -hmm. at the start of 2020. A little bit came in 21. Uh -huh. Bulk of the money came in after the rally had already played out, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and obviously then investors were mm. staring at negative returns. In fact, now mm. you'd see that money is actually slowly mm -hmm. trickling out of these mm -hmm. funds, right? Yeah. Now, that's the challenge. The entry was wrong. Got you know, it. they're probably exiting also the wrong time. You never know when tech could turn it's, around. It's like, right? uh, it's like entering a restaurant when the last order has already been called, right? Or yeah. when the music is just about stopping, that's when you enter a party. So Absolutely. not yeah. much fun. Okay, we have to take a quick break on that note. Uh, but we have lots of, uh, you know, viewer queries as well on sectoral funds. And we'll try and get Kostab to answer some of those questions in just a bit.
Let's talk money.